Welcome to Meet the Author, where you can join in on insightful conversations with best-selling and award-winning indie published authors. Your hosts today are Rob and Joan, who themselves are indie published authors, book publicists, and paranormal investigators with Tampa Bay Spirits, based in Tampa Bay, Florida. Thanks for dropping by. And now, on with the show. Welcome, everybody. I'm Rob. I'm Joan. We're glad that you're here to watch and listen, whether you're watching us live or you're listening to us later on. We're really glad that you chose to listen to our show and to tune in. We appreciate it. Also, let me remind you, and I'm really bad about reminding you to do this, but go over to our YouTube channel. What's the name of it? Meet the Author Podcast. Oh, yeah. Meet the Author Podcast. And give us, a, if you haven't already subscribed, subscribe. Give us a like, and we love to have your comments. Oh, yay. <laughs> Marjorie's in the house. Hey, Marjorie. Marjorie Daring. Hi, all. Strapped in and ready to go. <laughs> well, we're glad that you're no, here. No, we don't want you to fall out of your chair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you might, though. You might. Uh, yeah. Joe Conjol says, Happy New Year, Robin Joan. Happy, Happy New, New Year, Year jo you Joe. I'm so glad that you're you're here. I hope you all had a happy new year. Yeah. We had a very loud one. We did. They had us <laughs> surrounded out here. Yeah. <clears throat> we didn't need to go anywhere for fireworks. <laughs> we just walked outside and it was a 300. All around us. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> so George Dismukes, I had trouble reading that, George, says, okay, I'm here, surfically pober yeah. and ready to blast off. Perfectly sober is what he's saying. Oh, look at who's here. Hey, Becca. Bonnie and Becca Jones. Well, it might just be Becca. Hello. Happy, happy New Year. Happy I will New subscribe Year to, you. to your YouTube. Thanks, yes, Becca. Do that. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be helpful. <laughs> yes. And do comment. We, we really love to hear, hear your comments, see your comment. I know our authors do. Um, we want to remind you that if you read a book to review a book, it's very important to our authors. And also all of these wonderful authors that you meet on our show, buy their book. Yeah. And if you hear this podcast later on down the road and you like it, and it wouldn't hurt for you if you're in another country or even here in the U.S. to just send us an email, carternovels at AOL.com and uh, let us know. Let us know how you like it. Yeah. Or if you don't like it. Yeah. But if you don't like it, let us know why so we can change or fix it. Or maybe. 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 <laughs> well, at least we'll have a clue what's going on, yeah. right? Um, I want to remind everybody about the Voice of Any podcast uh, tonight, of course, uh, every Wednesday night after our show. Uh, it's on blogtalkradio.com. We have all the instructions on our last commercial of the show. Uh, after we sign off, we play that, and it gives you detailed instructions on how to get to Voice of Indie uh, podcast. That's Beam Weeks and Gary G's, really good people. Yeah. This week's guest is uh, B.A. Johnson, and mm -hmm. I think we have a yeah, we do. little banner right there. for there. Here we go. This week's guest is B.A. Johnson, mm -hmm. and she's an author, I believe. She, Yeah, and I think she could be. <laughs> right. The other thing I wanted to mention, if you could bring up uh, Siren Hunter. Sure. The Siren Hunter is part three in the Siren Song series written by George Dismukes going to launch still in February, but as you can see there, there's the email if you want to pre-order uh, a copy. You can get it now for only $12. You don't have to pay now. Uh, just get your name on the list. And uh, that's his lovely wife, uh, Nadine, on yeah. the cover. Myanar International at yahoo.com, and that's yes. I-N-T-L. Okay. Abbreviated. Um, this Saturday, I want to remind everybody about Episode Rewind. Um, catch that right where you're watching right now. Um, it's a, a replay from last year. Uh, Doug Cooper is the uh, sci-fi author that's on. He's the author of the Crystal series. Uh, very interesting, very interesting show. Yeah. All of you authors out there that are big on Twitter, you know who Doug Cooper is. Yeah. And yes. next week, we have two authors in one now how could that be well it's a, the author is robin madrich she's a romance author but she also writes under the name uh, of joe allen ash uh, 
and she's a young adult author, and she wrote uh, a young adult dystopian sci-fi fantasy, The Shadows We Make, and her romance series is the Connor Falls Christmas series, I believe. So that should be an interesting show. Yeah. And what else do we have? Anything else? We have a New York Times bestseller waiting what? backstage. You're kidding. No, I well, know. maybe we should uh, not Bring keep them him waiting on. any longer then, right? I agree. Okay. Ron Francel, welcome aboard. <laughs> hey, thank you for having me. What a treat. <laughs> thank yeah. you for being here. It's a treat to have you on with us. I know. I think it's great. So you're I talking to him here backstage thinking I should have a uh, pseudonym and, and write... <laughs> All kinds of other marvelous things besides there, yes, aka. <laughs> AKA. There you go. That's a big discussion here, you know, whether you should, you know, write under your name or a pseudonym, and if whether you should write under uh your one name you know, for all the genres that you're writing in. I mean, we discuss this a lot. I'm pro. Brand yourself, keep that brand no matter what genre you're yeah. doing, because you know eventually that's people what I think. Catch on, hopefully. Yes. Yeah. I think if you're successful with your name or any name for that matter, stick with it. Keep it. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And, yes. and we've been talking about that very thing, and we're gonna talk about it tonight. The idea that uh, my bones have been made writing true crime. But here I am about to launch a crime fiction. And the question is, will the people who've loved Ron Francel's true crime follow into crime fiction? Um, if so, well, then no pseudonym needed. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm sure that they will. Well, people, you know. I think so. <laughs> I think so, too. I think I told you that some of our daughters are real, I mean, avid true crime aficionados. And um, but they also read a lot of fiction and nonfiction. So um, I, I, I don't think it matters to, to readers. It could be a whole new market um, that, that wants to be associated or at least to meet me and yeah. see what, I, what I'm putting out there. And that's good. Yeah, uh, as long as I don't mess with them and I don't uh, mm -hmm. betray them, then, then that's a good thing too. It'll just be that moment when it comes out and people say, oh, well, Ron Francel writes true crime. Um, it's, it's like typecasting in Hollywood. You mm -hmm. know, uh, yeah. we, we've grown so accustomed to seeing um, a, a one actor, let's say, who is always comedic and is always funny, mm -hmm. but he really wants to do Shakespeare. Yeah. Now, will we be able to, to handle him doing Shakespeare? And that becomes the great question. So, uh, And you know what? We can handle that if he's good at it. I think you're right. Because we've seen right. that. And, and if they stink at it, you're like, yeah, you should stay with comedy. But, you know... I think that if they do it well, and I am sure that you do it well, then you should do what you want to do. What there makes you're you about to find out, aren't we? We are. <laughs> Joe Conjol says, I'm with you, Joan, plus you work so hard to get the meaning, keep your own name. I'm with you, Joan, plus you work so hard to get the books out there that I want people to know it's me, lol. <laughs> gotta get the credit, man. That's for sure. It's me. I'm Joe well, that's Conjol. Right. That's right. That. Yeah. So, no, it's awfully hard, too. I think that one one interesting thing that we might talk about later is that the, the great bulk of buyers of books today in the United States are women. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in true crime, it's as many as four out of five books get sold to women. Oh. So uh, they're, they're, one could argue that having a woman's byline on the book would would be a plus well i'm not a woman and if i were to adopt a pseudonym might there be some wisdom in taking a woman's name well yes there might be but then that makes this kind of thing difficult it makes it difficult to sustain that illusion 
in a book signing or a book talk or, uh, you know, a, a, a podcast of any kind. Um, and then people, then you deal with the idea that people feel betrayed in some way. And I, I think that gets into the territory where I don't want to go. I don't want my readers to feel betrayed. They might so, not like my mysteries versus my true crime, or they might love my mysteries instead of my true crime. But I did, not like I did it up front. I said, here it is, and here yeah. I am. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's interesting to me that uh, the majority of true crime purchasers are women, and that I I had already told you our daughters, three, three of our daughters are avid true crime. Yes. I wonder what that is. I know what it is with our daughters. We wait, we raise like these warrior women who are advocates for everybody in the downtrodden. And, and so they want to be a part of that, um, that help for, they, they really like cold case files. Um, they like to be part of that, to help solve that, to, to maybe, um, you I'll know, affect a change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I wonder why that is. Are we there, all? There are many reasons. <laughs> uh, and part of it is, I think it's, it's, it, it's without gender. Uh, going back to caveman days, it's, there's something primitive in us that, that wants to know the threats that are out there and wants to know how we can avoid unnecessarily dying from them uh, and and at a very basic DNA kind of level uh, that's part of the appeal of true crime right now um, because it's always been the appeal of true crime now I think there are a lot of other things at work right now with media and and um, the, the proliferation of different media but uh, I think at the very core, we're, we're dealing with a very primitive reaction to understand the threats that are out there, uh, to survey those threats, to prepare ourselves in some way uh, to see them coming and to avoid dying unnecessarily. <laughs> There you go. We have a comment from George. I'm not surprised by this comment, by the way. <laughs> the women are doing research in case they decide to take out their ragtag husbands. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I know more than one man who has said that very thing that I'm really <laughs> my wife watching 24 7 investigation discovery or <laughs> uh, and, and a, a wall full of true crime books. Is she just researching? Just researching. Just, just <laughs> messing around with it. Hey, Ron, um, you know, everybody knows here that's watching that you're a New York Times bestseller. Can you kind of tell us about your journey from uh, the big publisher to indie? Sure. I, uh, I referred to it a little bit there. Um, but it, throughout my career, uh, Death Row, which is coming in February, is my 19th book. Throughout my career, I've bounced between small indie publishers, medium-sized uh, uh, traditional publishers, uh, and until the big ones. Uh, you know, I've published with St. Martin's and Berkeley and Prometheus. Uh, so I think that I'm, we are all in a period here where you go where they want your books. Um, now, my very first book was a literary novel. And, and a literary novel by an unknown guy in Wyoming uh, just doesn't have that uh, cachet that, that people want to, uh, the editors want to go out and buy it immediately for big bucks. Uh, it sold to a very small startup house, traditionally published, but a very small house. Uh, within weeks, within uh, I think about six or eight weeks, it the reprint rights, the paperback rights, were picked up by Berkeley. You know, now a Penguin Random House in yeah. uh, 
book was that? It, that was my book, Angel Fire, which, um, again, we it had is. 37 rejections along the way until that sold. Uh, we were about to give up when it did sell. So, 37, so uh, don't give up, folks. <laughs> it, it's number 38. Uh, but uh, the, the the book goes on to be named by the San Francisco Chronicle as one of the 100 best novels of the 20th century West. Wow. Uh, surprising nobody more than me. Because <laughs> you sold this little book to a little publisher and it was a little book and it was not an important book. Well, it turns out that it had something more to it. Berkeley picked it up. It, be, it became a very popular book. Um, I wrote a couple mysteries after that, but it was book number four that, that set me on the path to becoming a uh, true crime writer. And very soon, the, 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 darkest, night. Of the darkest Night was, um, uh, it locked me up. I, I then, uh, the, the, the people we have on our teams, agents and editors and publicists and booksellers, they all want now more of what has succeeded, more true crime, uh, to the point where uh, from book number four to book number 19, I could only do one non-crime book. And, and it, was, it was really done without my team. I wanted to do the book. It was an important book, uh, but I was forced to do it on my own and basically go out and find an editor in a house. Uh, I guess it's a long way of saying that along the way from book number one to, to book 19, yes. um, I've, I've been with indies. I've been with tr big trade publish, uh, publishing. Um, and each has uh, served a purpose, uh, whether it's getting the book out there, whether it's a change, in this case, uh, of genre. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they have their strengths. They all have their strengths. And uh, it, it, it's not good or bad. It, it, I don't have a preference We all want to get our books out there. Yes, making money is nice, but if you're really a storyteller you want that story to be out there think about you it you want to tell the story that's right yeah. being a storyteller right. takes two i i tell it but i need somebody to hear it to hear it yeah, yeah that's right <laughs> otherwise if, if, uh, if I, I there's nothing wrong with journaling and diary uh, diaries yeah. but for a, uh, storytelling takes at least two yeah. And and it becomes very important to me every time I write one of these books, uh, it becomes very important to me to think about who will be hearing it, who will be reading yeah. it. Okay. Joe Conjol has a question. He says, hi, Ron, when you are writing true crime, how much of the story is true versus embellished for entertainment value? None is embellished. It's true I'm writing crime. true crime. True it's crime. going to be true. Yeah. Um, I write in a style known as narrative nonfiction, which means that I, I tell a story using some of the tools from a novelist's toolbox, foreshadowing and, and dialogue where it's possible, uh, character arc. In my case, though, in the case of narrative nonfiction, th that is telling an absolutely true story with those techniques so that it feels like you're reading a novel. But Capote invented narrative nonfiction with In Cold Blood. Oh, yeah. Ooh. And he made some mistakes. Capote was a fiction writer trying to do journalism. And, and he had no roadmap. He had no rule book. He did what he did. Today, we look back and we say, you know, he made up a few things. Um, and that makes it untrue. 
to me. In, it, yes, it's no longer yeah, nonfiction. Yeah. It's, exactly. It's, I, so it's what, not yeah. nonfiction if what part of it is fiction. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and this comes from my journalism. I, I can't make up anything. Now, the, the structure of the story is something different. And that's where I'm using those tools that I mentioned. Um, and, and there are many, but uh, it's, it's unfortunate that a lot of people believe that narrative nonfiction uh, introduces uh, imagined things. And if it's good stuff, if it's honest stuff, it doesn't do that. That's I not think, to say there aren't those out there, but if it's good stuff, it doesn't do that. I think it comes from people watching a lot of true crime shows where yeah. things are dramatized, okay, yeah. and things are definitely hyped. I mean, we're paranormal investigators. We've watched a lot of the shows. It's a lot of hype. Yeah, we even know some of those people, we and we know that they don't go, oh, my God, they don't do that. I mean, you're out there. And we you're... know that some of the networks and streaming services, the production, the company. production companies have told exactly. them, you got to get some you gotta do excitement this. in there. You need to act you know, afraid. You're not afraid, it, but you, you know, need to yeah. act afraid because people want to think that it's scary. Right. Well, and I've been invited to do television shows on true crimes that I've written about some that mm -hmm. I haven't written about, but they have to find their hook. They have to find that angle that's going to separate them from the last people who did an episode yes. on Ted Bundy. Yeah. Uh, and I think sometimes without any um, moral or ethical journalistic grounding, uh, they think it's okay to say, well, if it could be true, then it's okay. And I've refused to be on a couple of TV episodes for the reason that their hook was simply floating a theory and treating it as if it were true. Um, and it, 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 it just wasn't. Then that's not journalism, that's entertainment. And that, what I do in that's my true. stuff, that's in my true time, I'm doing journalism. That's that's the difference. Marjorie Deering had a comment. She said, I think a lot of the true crime interest comes from a genuine curiosity about the workings of criminal minds. No. And that 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 could be too. We need to take our break. And okay. they're all different. That's the thing. That they're all different. <laughs> Two more comments, then we'll take a break and we'll hear a word from our sponsors. All right. George Dismuke says theatrics is the first law of marketing. And yeah, theatrics is okay. You, you don't want to tell a story like this because everybody's going to, they don't going to care what you're telling you. Right, they're going to fall asleep yeah. or train to channel. Right. Yeah. But there's a difference between theatrics and making stuff up. Making stuff up. <laughs> I think so. I think that making oh, it yeah. interesting is yeah. important. That's it isn't otherwise no one's gonna to listen to your story. Nobody's gonna read it. No. Joe Congel said with true crew trime crew trime. <laughs> what oh. the heck is that? You got George's uh, whole new <laughs> I, got George, I have George's <laughs> disease. With Joe Joe Congel says, with true crime, do you ever have someone who is in the story that won't sign a release or changes their mind later? If so, how do you handle or get around something like that? Uh, I've had people not want to sign releases, um, but um, I think that it, it's important, too, to know that I don't need a release on every single thing. A lot of, uh, a lot of the kinds of things that I'm writing about are in a public record of some kind. They're in a police file. Mm -hmm. They're in a courtroom, uh, yeah. uh, in a trial. They're yeah. in uh, investigative files. They're yeah. they're in reports. Yeah. In yeah. media, in different places. So. Um, so you uh, don't need a release. <laughs> you don't always need a release, but yeah, sometimes, sometimes I have uh, people that don't want to talk, and then yeah. I I'm challenged then to find the information that they would provide yeah. or not be able to report that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
We're going to take a quick break now, just a couple of minutes. Don't go away, folks. Don't go away. Come back. We're going to continue we'll right our conversation. Thank you for joining us here on Meet the Author. Make sure you stay up to date with our show by clicking like. Oops. Welcome to Magnolia Bluff, Texas, a small town in the heart of the Texas Hill Country near Burnett Reservoir, a town where everyone's business is discussed at the local coffee shop, a town where neighbors look out for each other, a town not insulated from murder and mayhem, which begs these questions. Who is responsible for breaking into quaint Victorian homes? And how are poodles, ghosts, drug cartels, and a Ponzi scheme connected with a serial killer? Caroline McCluskey, the town's librarian, catalogs books using the Dewey Decimal System. When a black and white poodle puppy arrives unannounced, she calls him Dewey. Now, Caroline must catalog events to identify a serial killer in her town. Pick up your copy of The Dewey Decimal Dilemma, now available on Amazon. They thought the siren was dead. In the novel, Siren Song, by author George Dismukes, James Harmon shot her twice. Several people saw her dead body sinking slowly into the abyss. But now, in Siren Song 2, Evidence suggests that she may still be alive. She killed that boatload of people. It was her! And she's just getting started! Angie, that's impossible. The cold chill up my spine tells me it's not impossible. We've got to start all over again. And this time, do it right. Siren Song 2. The story continues. Available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and many other bookseller websites. Get your copy today. At Indie Bookstores, you can shop by genre or by author, and you will be buying direct from the author's main purchase link. We offer hundreds of titles and formats that include ebooks, paperback, hardbound, and audiobook. Support an indie author. Visit IndieBookSource.com today. And we're back. Yeah. And Rob was going to end the show quite I early. almost ended the show. <laughs> it would have been too short. Do you want to hit that button? And he said yes. And I'm like, no. So now we're looking for somebody who could actually do the job right. <laughs> oh, boy. We have a comment from Joe Conjol. And it's funny because we warned... <laughs> We, we Ron, told you this was coming, that now, this didn't was we, coming. Ron? <laughs> okay, Joe Conjol said, okay, Ron, the most important question of the night, are you a plotter or a pantser, LOL? Had you ever heard those terms before? I had not, but okay. I I know uh, what Joe's talking about. Um, and it depends on the work. My very first novel, I, I outlined it endlessly. Um, I'm a big believer in the hero's journey story model. Uh, and I really worked hard to, to plot this out uh, using that model. Uh, to this day, somewhere here, I have, uh, a, a, I don't know, might be a ream of paper. It's probably not. Uh, <laughs> drafts and, and notes and and. and so there I was a plotter. Uh, I was really overdoing it. After that, it became more internalized. And then by the time I'm doing true crime, um, I really don't have to worry about plot. I know I know what happened. No, what? It happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have no, no uh, ability to change that. Now... Right. When I write my true crime, I'm trying to write um, a novel over which I have absolutely no control. I, I, it's, it's in the way I'm telling it more than what I'm telling. And, and so in that respect, I'm a pantser. Uh, although uh, the amount of research I do, 
uh, I would probably plop me down fully in the plotter category. Uh, but by the time I'm writing, I know how it's going. And it's just a matter of following along with the truth and, and the reality of what happened. So pretty much your outline is the chronological order of things that have happened. Sure. Right. It's already written for you that way. It, it, exactly. And and I might choose not to tell it chronologically. Right. Uh, but sure. that that's uh, that's a function or a form and function pro uh, a problem. Right. Right. We're, right. We're just we, we're doing it differently. And by by now, 19 books later, I've internalized that whole plotting uh, process uh, to the point where it's more instinctive now. So I don't do graphs and notes and and have things posted all over. Uh, but I, I, um, I still am thinking about the, the, the roadmap how I'm going to get from page one to page 500. Right. And make it entertaining. So that, I mean, interesting. So people want to read it. I'll read you that one. Marjorie Deering said, Ron, have you ever written about a case that left you wondering if the criminal was actually innocent? That's a good question, Marjorie. <clears throat> uh, uh, I've written about cases where up to a certain point, Everybody believed the 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 I don't know not the criminal the the the, the subject was guilty, uh, but then I get to tell the the rest of the story, so to speak, and and show that he is not guilty. Mm -hmm. But I I haven't written about any crime um, in which I think uh, the criminal isn't guilty i can't think of one i can't think of one that makes me feel like the guy i wrote about isn't guilty and and it hasn't been revealed yet yeah. uh, i just I, if i felt that way i have a feeling i wouldn't write the story that way i'd write yeah. the story saying i think there's a lot of question about this yeah yeah gotcha well, let's tell people how they can reach you. Let's get your information out there. All right. Ron's website is ronfrancel.com and it's R-O-N-F-R-A-N-S-C-E-L-L. -L. Okay. And you can find him on Facebook at author Ron Francel, on Twitter at Ron Francel, on LinkedIn Ron Francel, I'm really happy. Yes. Let's hold off on the email. All right. We're going to hold off on the email because... Because I want to talk here a little bit. Okay. Ron, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. Which book did you decide to read from? I, I'm going to read tonight from Death Row. Okay. okay. Now now this is coming. The I want everybody to know that this is the one that you're going to be given away, right? In the book, uh, so I want them to get a little taste of of what they're going to be entering for. This is and this is Death Row, and let's go ahead and repeat again. This is actually fiction. This so, one is fiction, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's informed by uh, you know um, fifteen years. Well, I was a journalist almost all my life. I you know I. A friend of mine and I started our junior high school newspaper in seventh grade. So if you count my journalism career starting in seventh grade, I've been a journalist all but 12 years of my life. <laughs> and, and through much of that as a professional, I was a police and courts reporter. So therefore, death row is informed by the reality of what's going on out there and of, of the true crime, too. But uh, uh, it, it is a fiction uh, in the end. It is a fiction. There are a lot of interesting, real elements to it. And readers, when they finally get the book next month, 
uh, and read through it, they're going to discover that there's maybe more than just a tip of the hat to real true crime. There's actually some real uh, true crime bits of this story. facts in there. Yeah. So I'll read from page one. Okay. This is, this is what a reader will see uh, when he opens the book. The, the hero's name, by the way, is Woodrow Bell. He's his nickname. He's a retired Denver homicide detective. Uh, he wants nothing more than to just fade away and be done with people. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he, he is introduced to a particular crime that, that has haunted the little town where he's retired uh, for a few decades. And he doesn't really want to be part of it, but there's something that says this is what his purpose is. This is, this is what he was put on this earth to do, is, is to solve crime. And it's what he did for his life. Uh, now he can't get away from it. And uh, uh, at this moment that I'm describing when I read, he, he hasn't gotten aboard. But uh, this is where he begins to uh, learn a, a little bit about this, this. So chapter one. Woodrow Bell checked his watch, although he had no place special to be. Nursing homes just made him feel the time was passing unusually fast. The big man damn near filled the cramped visitor's foyer as he surveyed the dreary day room of the old miner's home. The sun was going down. It was Sunday, and the two nurses were elsewhere. Pale September twilight swathed the cheerless room as white-haired shadows silently drifted in for dinner like dust that hadn't yet been blown away. Now past 70, Bell knew he too was closer to the end than the beginning. It haunted him. And it wasn't just the drabness of the old miner's home with its dog-eared furniture, folding dinner tables, and the giant craft paper calendar on the bulletin board that was utterly empty. It was the stiff knees, the, the hard mornings, the shrinking social circle, caring less and less about more and more, not remembering if it was the first time or the last time, getting up twice a night to pee a thimbleful, <laughs> the, AR, the AARP junk mail, the unreliable pecker, the fear that you can't finish Sunday crosswords because you have Alzheimer's. The daughter who never calls. The mystery of why you ever voted for Democrats. <laughs> Already knowing which suit you'll be buried in. And being invisible to the rest of the world. It all pissed him off most days. And today was one of those days. After months of making excuses... He'd been tricked by his closest friend, Father Bert Clancy, into visiting the old miner's home. It wasn't because the priest lied, not even because a priest, uh, not even because a friend lied, but because Bell didn't immediately realize he was being played. He especially hated that. In truth, the St. Barnabas Senior Center hadn't been the old miner's home since the Nixon administration. But everybody in the trifling mountain village of Midnight, Colorado, still called it the old miner's home. Good or bad, small towns seldom quit on a memory. So that's page one. Excellent. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and being people into their 70s <laughs> with white hair. <laughs> you're the, you're the, core, market. Call you're the core market for this book. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Joe Conjol says, Ron, have you ever been approached by someone who was 
convicted whose story you haven't written about that wants you to tell their story? Uh, absolutely. Um, almost weekly, really. Maybe not weekly. Wow. Weekly, certainly. Wow. Um, you're, uh, they're, they're, everybody has a story. Yeah. And, and a few of them are, are uh, worth looking at. But the fact is that that all those years that we talked about uh, as a journalist and as a writer, um, uh, you you come to learn that the people in prison uh, it, always have an angle that they're playing. They always want something. Now sometimes it's totally legit. Maybe maybe they didn't do it. Um, I don't know that a crime writer is the guy you go to to prove that. If you have proof, I'm not sure a crime writer is the guy that's best to have. It's going to help you, yeah. Maybe yeah. Defensive uh, crime might really help. are others. And and on the other hand, I've also written about, my, in my book, uh, Alice and Gerald, a homicidal love story. Um, Gerald and Alice together and separately killed five people. Um, you know, it, it was, um, I, I've described it as boy meets girl, uh, boy marries girl, boy and girl kill five people and live happily ever after. <laughs> Alice died in prison. And that day, Gerald wrote me a letter saying he knows he confessed to doing all these crimes, but he didn't do any of them. She did it. Uh, that's just provably not true, <laughs> but um, that's part of what a journalist and a writer has to be careful about. You have to really, again, we get back to that ethical standard. Let, let me take a, a, a disinterested position. By that, I mean uh, as unbiased as I possibly can and and tell the story and not try to be an advocate one way or the other because I'll get that gives you a blind side. Well, you got to give Gerald credit for a good hail mary there at the end, right? It, it, <laughs> get by the way, the way. It, wasn't, it wasn't me. Now that she's dead, I can tell you the truth. Yeah, dead wives tell no tales. They do not. Marjorie Deering says that opening makes the character so relatable yeah, and also so, very, so very authentic, very, very. <laughs> very real. Thank you. That's nice to hear. And that's the point. Uh, in any storytelling, we have to have somebody that the reader cares about, somebody that's going to keep that reader turning the page and fi to find out what happens. And, and in the case of the protagonist of this particular story, that that's necessary. You have to care what happens to him. Um, and, and so what Marjorie's saying there is, is uh, uh, gratifying. It's what every author wants to hear. We need to take our second break. We're a little behind schedule here. That's okay. When we come back, we'll do our book giveaway right away, and then we'll we'll do some more talking. Okay? And if I can do this right without wasting <laughs> us out of the entire program. So stand by, folks. Madison Jackson loved being a cop. A young girl is raped and murdered near Burnett Reservoir. Madison vows to get justice for the child. Madison travels to the heart of Mexican cartel country. She is kidnapped, tortured. Will Madison ever make it home? Justice by Kelly Marshall. Only at Amazon.com. Many secrets are hidden within the darkness of the jungle. Behold, this one about a man, a woman, a black jaguar, 
in an ancient Maya legend. Two Faces of the Jaguar is a novel by George Dismukes that will take you deep into the jungle and capture your imagination into the last word. Two Faces of the Jaguar is book one of a trilogy. Two Faces of the Jaguar, where only the adventurous dare to read. Two Faces of the Jaguar, The Lost City, and The Jaguar's Quest are available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and many other bookseller websites. Two Faces of the Jaguar, the book people are talking about. Get your copy today. In a world where advancing technology is outpacing crime-solving, the O'Rourke team continues their relentless pursuit of justice. Bioprince is the first book in the O'Rourke crime novel series where it's high-tech crime versus old-fashioned detective work. Visit carternovels.com or amazon.com and check out Bioprince today. And we're back. First of all, let's uh, get your email up here for the book giveaway. Do you want to do the email? Yes. I don't trust you anymore. No. <laughs> I'll go right over here. I'm taking this back. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ron's email is ron at ronfrancel.com. That's easy. And then the book giveaway, you may read that. The first three people, U.S. only, to email Ron at ronfrancel.com will win a signed paperback copy of Death Row after the February 14th on, uh, upon release, of course, after the release. Yes. So you'll have to wait a while, but, you know, you will eventually get it. I do want to go ahead and put up that cover again. Let me find it. Here we Here go. Is. Actually, that looks like a really... That's a really good cover. Can you describe the cover for us, Ron? Pardon? Can you describe the cover for those that are just listening? Uh, the Death Row uh, cover is a very cold feeling mountain scene with icy roads and a mysterious pickup truck uh, on, the, on the road in, in front of us. And, uh, I guess the question will be, what is that truck and why is it up in the, uh, what looks like a coming blizzard? Uh, it's a very, uh, when I use the word chilling, and I don't mean it in the traditional mystery sense of the word, but because it, it just gives off a very cold vibe. Yeah, it does. Could you? It's a really good color. Uh, do you, do you want to, first of all, explain the title? Because it sounds a lot like Death Row. It does. But there's a reason for that. But do, do you want to explain is, it? Or? No, is that a spoiler? I don't think it's a spoiler. No, it's not a spoiler. Um, we find out fairly early. Uh, in the uh, though, uh, the, uh, Woodrow Bell, who we met, uh, again, doesn't really want to associate with people. He's the, the only people he associates with is a small group of 70 and 80 and 90 year old guys in this small town. Uh, you, know, you know, every small town has this little group of old guys who gather on most mornings at the, yep. at the local diner to... Yep discuss what's wrong with the world and to fix everything and to poke fun at each other and sort of remember their glory days. Um, and uh, he's part of a group like that. And the group of these white haired old gents call themselves deaf row, deaf row. Uh, and <laughs> they, they end up playing the role of uh, of Woodrow Bell's forensic team unwittingly and here and there. But because he's going to look into this case and he no longer has all those resources that he had when he was with the Denver PD, um, each one of these old guys has his own contribution. And, and 
what's interesting about that is that it's the other side of this mystery. This book has two stories going on. One is this mystery, and it's, it's a ghastly case. Um, but it's about growing old, too. It, it, it's, I think it's been either the blessing or the curse of my writing career that I just don't want to do it like everybody else. And uh, in my true crime, I've blended the journalism and, and the fiction technique and tried to do it a little bit differently. Um, in Death Row, I'm trying to blend commercial crime fiction with a more literary exploration of men who are, uh, maybe maybe they've outlived their best days. Maybe, maybe all the good purpose in their life is behind them, or at least they feel it is, uh, that that they're growing invisible to yeah, the rest of the world. You know, that's not a story that's told very often. You yep. you hear, you know, people are put away into nursing homes and, and you know, they get, they get Alzheimer's and, and don't remember anything, Absolutely. so they just kind of fade away in the background, you know. And, you know, and actually, that's exactly it. Yeah. You know, my dad, and uh, I'm still 10 years shy of when my dad did that, but my dad belonged to a group of men like that, mm -hmm. didn't he? Yeah. And they met, the same old men met for breakfast every morning. He ate all the things that he shouldn't have been eating every morning. <laughs> and enjoyed it. And it? enjoyed yeah. it, yeah. And they solved the world's problems and complained about everything. And... um yeah, talked about their glory days and said the same things over and over and over again. And he drove me crazy. Well, <laughs> see, that's that's those are familiar people to all of us. Mm -hmm. We, and we recognize real. them. And in death yes. row, we have the retired newspaper editor and the retired town doctor and the retired uh, fire chief and a, a high school teacher each one of them through the story brings some special sort of uh, skill uh, or talent to the table that moves the investigation, this casual investigation, uh, a little further down the line. And, and in, in that respect, they prove they still have value. I, yeah. I love the fact that your hero is in his 70s because yeah. we're in our 70s. I love the fact that he's still making a contribution. And I love the fact that you're telling the truth. Anyone who reaches the stage of their life that we're in that says they don't consider their mortality <laughs> is lying. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because you do. That is, I mean... Come on. Everybody knows we have less time ahead of us than we have and behind every us. Every day goes faster and faster, it seems like. It does. Know? It really well, does. And, and we talked about it a little earlier, this, the, the market. And the market right now in big publishing is appealing to those that those female buyers that are out there. And, and mystery in particular has canted significantly toward female driven stories mm -hmm. after my last true crime book shadow man um the we naturally took this new crime fiction to berkeley at penguin random house uh and really without reading the book uh they said you know the chances of it finding a home here are slim because we're going more with female driven stuff we went through a long time of glowing rejection. People, editors out there who loved the characters or the writing or the plot or something, but it didn't fit their view of, of uh, the book that was going to capture the attention of those, those female buyers. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, we found a home with Wild Blue Press, a very feisty a uh, small indie publisher who's bringing out Defro, regardless 
of it being largely about old white men. It has plenty of female characters in it, and then they're just as fascinating. But the core is is that group of men. Um, and so that, that was another reason why we ended up going with an in, a smaller indie publisher was because it served the, the book. The, the way we could get this book out there, the way we could talk to a reader was that way, was Wild Blue Press. And you have to let us know how it does. Yeah. Because yeah. that is absolutely. I mean, I know a lot of people that are listening want want to know it, how that does. It's uh Joe Condal says it's a great looking cover and and Thank it you. is it's a beautiful yeah, cover. Beautiful. And then Marjorie Deering actually has a question. Um more fiction in your future Ron, yay or nay? Uh, yes, there is, uh, because I'm writing right now the sequel to Death Row. Oh, uh, good. Part of the deal that there had to be another one. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm working on that. But interestingly, what I'm doing is I'm taking a real crime that I actually know about and uh, fictionalizing it. Yeah, so you my research is um, as if I were writing a true crime. Uh, but in this case, you know, going back to that very first question we had about fictionalizing or making things up within a true crime, I'm going to write a novel that's going to have uh, a, a great degree of truth. Sort of like historical fiction crime. Exactly. Crime exactly. Crime. I'm not inventing any new genre. It's just that wow. that's something I wanted to play with and uh, <laughs> I'm having a great time. That's great. Yeah, that, that's that's really great. This is really an interesting concept and I really mm -hmm. love the way that opened because <laughs> it so was so relatable. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm not a man, but I am a white haired old person. <laughs> but you know what? I, I've read books where women protagonists um, are take front and center. Uh, I don't ever really recall thinking, oh, no, I'm, I can't be interested in this because it's about right. a woman. Um, and I think there's, there's a certain shallowness in publishers saying, well, to get women's interest, we need to write about women. Certainly, that will interest women. But I, I think it, it excludes the possibility that maybe they're interested in more than just the sex of the protagonist, uh, I, I, I think we're not that shallow. Well, no. if but the bean counters are. If that's what I was just <laughs> going to say. Anyone that's worked in corporate America yeah, yeah. knows that in the person that's out there that's doing the work, you know, whatever mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. work is, actually knows what's going on. But there are the bean counters, and they say, "Well, you're going to do it this way," and it doesn't matter if you say. Uh, that's not the best way to do this, right, you know, right, right. It, it, and this is not a good move and it's not going to serve our clientele or our customer, or, you know, whatever part of corporate America you're in. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter because they're the ones put and that's who's pushing what you're talking sure, about. That's, that's exactly it. The, the, <laughs> the saving grace is that everything changes. Nothing, nothing <laughs> stays the same. Uh, eventually, someday, we'll come around to, to different ways of thinking about that. And uh, But I think the reading public, especially today, where we have a million point something new titles every year. Yeah. Uh, you can't have a million point something of the same story. They have to be different. They have to be different. Sorry about that editorial comment from Missy. <laughs> from, from the doggy gallery. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what she saw out there, but it did not make her happy. <laughs> I'd like to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, we have a lot of authors um, that are indie, obviously indie authors. Um, and what advice do you have for submitting query letters who to send them to, 
to uh, where to get the information, uh, the best formats and, and that sort of thing, um, to even how to do it. Uh, a lot of people don't know how to send query letters into publishers. Sure. Um, let me rewrite your question. Good. Uh, Thank you. A little bit. <laughs> Before you get to all of that, write your book. I well, get yeah, a lot of, of questions yeah. from beginning writers and young writers, not always the same thing, um, about stuff like that. Where, How do I get a cover done? Or who, who, who gets yeah, the words? Right. And how yeah. do I find an agent? And almost always, they, they haven't written the book yet. They're yeah. worried about <laughs> things that there's going to be a lot of time to worry about later. Uh, write the book. Uh, practice. This is practice. This is, uh, you know, there's nothing but practice that goes into that. Um, like I said, if I go back to 12 years old, then I've been practicing for the last 50 years mm -hmm. and I'm still practicing. So mm -hmm. you, you just have to do that. As far as the uh, things have changed, um, Drastically. Me, uh, it used to be that you get Writer's Digest and you could, uh, the literary marketplace and all of that and get, yeah. get all the things you needed. Those things exist in different places and different forms. Thing, it used to be this sort of hidebound rule about the formatting of a query letter. Um, you can do it with email now. It, it, you know, there's... You, you still don't want to go too wild, but but there's a lot more uh, there's a lot more leeway than when I first started off. Plus, I have an agent. Uh, I actually have three agents. If you everybody's function is broken down between film and TV and literary and foreign rights and things like that, that's their job. So I'm left to worry about writing the book and being able to explain it to somebody. And uh, I, one thing that I've learned is that if you can't explain your book in 50 words, then you don't understand your book. Yeah, true. Okay. And, and frankly, yeah. I have trouble doing that myself. Boy, yeah. like, down into 50 words, but uh, especially when you go back, you know, 19 books back, you know, yes, you, haven't, you haven't looked exactly. at it for a while, right? <laughs> and, and uh, you know, a lot of the marketing that goes on relies on people who don't read books. The Hollywood people, agents, uh, you know, whatever. There, there are a bunch of people out there that don't want to read your book to find out what it's about. They want you to tell them in 50 words. So Becca, a, a Jones, good summary. Becca yeah. Jones wants to know, is it expensive to have an agent? It's expensive not to have an agent um, mm -hmm. in the sense that a lot of money can be left on the table when you're dealing with a big, uh, a big publisher. And many big publishers, I think, are still requiring an agent to be involved. But the cost of an agent is... Plain and simple. They only get a piece of what they sell. In other words, if they get you a hundred thousand dollar advance in in the standard fee is fifteen percent commission. So they they take fifteen thousand dollars and send you a check for eighty five thousand. You should never pay out of your pocket for any agenting. Period. Okay. Yeah. Good advice. The people who say, give me a thousand dollars and I'll try to sell your book are ripping you off. Yeah. Okay. We've had agents pitch our books for movies and, and TV series in uh, Canada and places like that. And we didn't have to pay anything. Right. Oh, Becca, we didn't have a movie either. Becca <laughs> said, no, we didn't. But they pitched them. They did they, pitch it for us. Yeah. yeah. As and, long as they pitch them, that's fine. They, as long as they have some skin in the game, yeah, they, they make, make no money unless they make you money. Right. And and I should say they came to us and asked us, "Can we pitch this?" And right. we said, "Go for it." Go for it. That's <laughs> fine. That's fine. It's just uh, it's just that you should never 
take money out of your pocket and hand it to somebody no. who says, I'll be your agent. No. Right. Uh, uh, Legitimate agents work on commission. Yep. Great, great advice. Do. Great advice. And Becca Jones says, thank you. You're <laughs> welcome. Says, Glad to okay. know that. And Joe Congel a while back asked if that was a delivery that Missy was upset yeah, about. Some kind of noise out there. Yeah, <laughs> no, it was. Might have been a ghost. It might have been a ghost. Yeah. We've been having stuff happening in our <laughs> house all week. So, and I know a lot of you often want to know about that. And this has been a very active haunted area. Cuckoo things have been happening. Very strange. Changing uh, gear completely. Gears again. Mm -hmm. Um, you spent time with the Denver Post yes. as a journalist, and you had to go over to the Middle East after 911, was it? Yes. And how was that experience? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Mm. I, it was um, something throughout my life that I wanted to do was to, to cover a war. And this was, uh, we were, a photographer and I and some of my other colleagues were sent to the Middle East by the Denver Post after 9-11 to cover the run-up to the war on terror. Um, my particular assignment was to get into as many Arab and Muslim countries as I possibly could and report on the, the perspective from that part of the world. I also embedded with some units. I was aboard the uh, USS Enterprise. I was uh, with a couple of other units throughout the Middle East at different times, but primarily reporting from the street of what Arabs and Muslims were talking about. Um, a perspective that we weren't necessarily that open to at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, right. But the questions that we had were legitimate. Why us? Why did you do this? And of course, the, the answer is that they didn't do it. The, 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 the radicals did it. But they had a perspective that we didn't, that we probably weren't as attuned to in 2001 as we, as we are now. Um, on, on a grander scale, though, it was flying home uh, after all my time there, and, and, and I was tired, and I wasn't sleeping well on the plane, that I saw a, um, a French news magazine and was leafing through it. And I don't read French, but I can read French pictures. And in this news magazine was a picture that I hadn't seen. We'd left the country so soon after 9-11 that we didn't see a lot of the American reporting that was going on. Uh, in this picture were two people leaping from the World Trade Center holding hands. It immediately flashed in my mind the, 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 the experience that I had uh, as a child growing up in a small town in Wyoming when my two next door neighbor girls were abducted and terrorized through the night, raped and murdered by being thrown off a very high bridge into a very deep canyon in the middle of nowhere. One of them died and one of them survived miraculously. Uh, and in my imagination, that picture was them. Now they hadn't been thrown off this bridge together, but in my mind, um, they were linked, and the it was the dark, the tiredness, the the imagery uh, took me back to that time when I was a child, and I determined there in in the dark over the Atlantic someplace that I was going to write about that case. Uh, and I did, and it became out. It came out as the book, "The Darkest Night," which, uh, as I said, became such a, a huge bestseller that I couldn't do anything else. Uh, you can see on that uh, cover the bridge. That is, in fact, the bridge. Uh, the two girls there. Um, people like Ann Rule and Vincent Pugliosi were 
um, very, very kind to the book and very generous about praising it. So again, it, it became such a success that it was very difficult for me to do anything else. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's heavy. Yeah. Well, you brought it up. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. For it's your that. fault. That was, that was my fault. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. You covered devastating Hurricane Rita, also. So I did. On a lighter note, I did. You know, those were those were my those are the days in my life that that um, that reflected why I did it. And and frankly, it it, it wasn't the danger. Uh, it it was simply to do something that not everybody else wanted to do, but they wanted to know about. Um, and that was my job. I mean, they figured that was my job. And the, the more honest I was about it, the better. But uh, it, uh, I, the, the war experience was such that when I came home, I, it wasn't important to me anymore to cover the the fourth of july parades or the city council meetings those those must be reported they're important but i didn't have to do it right um, i had covered war and and i wasn't even in the shooting part of it but i was up against people who were afraid and who were fleeing things and and occasionally we were afraid uh, it just wasn't important anymore to me to want to report on the parades and the council meetings because I had covered, I think, people at, in the worst moments of their lives. Yeah. Uh, right. And I think that's what we try to do in our books, too. Yes. George Desmuke says, fascinating show, very informative. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. And it has been very informative yes very informative and very fascinating yes I want to remind everybody deaf row coming out february and it sounds like a fascinating book if and you should email him to get your yeah. own signed copy email. i i bet i already have a dozen emails at least okay oh cool cool <laughs> probably i don't know i haven't seen i can't see that would be great but you know don't give up everybody anybody that you know, I'm sure Ron wouldn't mind saying hi anymore. I definitely right? would not. <laughs> Let's see. One more. Okay. Marjorie Daring said, thanks for another terrific podcast. You're welcome. Joe Conjol said, really enjoyed tonight's show. Thank you, Ron. And of course, Rob and Joan. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. That is. So unless you have anything you'd like to add, I think we're going to sign off Sign off for the evening. Thank you for helping writers touch readers. You are I welcome. Think that's, that's the most important thing, and we've talked about that. That mm -hmm. whole idea of storytelling takes two, and mm -hmm. you're bringing the two together. And so yeah. thank you for doing that. You're and welcome. You're it's very welcome. It's really our pleasure. Our pleasure. We're meeting and a lot of wonderful people. So yes, I really, by by and large, all the authors that we've met and that we know and that we've known some for years are wonderful, generous people. And all, I mean, this. Some of them are. Most of most them. Of them. Most, most of them are so them. helpful. <laughs> they want to help other authors. There is no. Do jealousy or i can't help you because then you know maybe you'll sell books and i won't there is there's nothing very, like that it's little, yeah yeah it's amazing I, as a young when i was writing that book the darkest night i it 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 made me nervous to to say um to ann rule who would i who we knew we didn't know each other uh, would you look at my book and 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 if you like it, would you say something about it? Um, I had no reason in the world to think she should or would. I just, uh, it was a nothing ventured, nothing gained moment. Yeah. And she did read the book and yeah. she didn't have to. 
Right. And the same thing with Vincent Bugliosi, who wrote Helter Skelter. Read the both of them read the book and were very generous with their their endorsements, um, and and they didn't need to. And so yes, writers are generous people most of the time. Yes, and I noticed most of them Anne, are. Anne Hillerman uh, yeah. endorsed uh, Duff Row, right? And Anne and I worked together as journalists years and years ago before either one of us had ever written the book. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, she, we've, we, we're friends, we're colleagues, and her endorsement of Death Row was, was really, really. In a C.J. Box, uh, John Lasqua, uh, people like that. When they say, "Hey, you did a good job," it, it's personally gratifying. But I also know that you, the reader um is it can be influenced by that yeah well we were almost done with the show but joe says how does that happen do you reach out or is that through agents he's he means did you reach out to ann rule yourself or i did, did. i reached out to ann rule myself and to vincent bugliosi uh now um i i have so many relationships throughout publishing i can do that easily um but for uh, writers that are just starting out and their first books are coming out, your agent can help, your editor can help. There will be people like that. But also, you know what? Uh, just take a header and, and write to Ron Francel and say, I've written this book. Um, no strings attached. Would you take a look and consider a blurb? And you never know. Ron oh, Francel wow. might... Say yes. <laughs> um, uh, you just never know. Oh, you don't and know. Nothing ventured, okay. nothing gained. Uh -huh. I, we, as a matter of fact, one of the authors that we had on a while ago um, did that with with Ann Hillerman, and she did. She read it, and she she wrote a, a blurb about it. She wrote a preface to it. Even. Right. Yeah. So, At the risk of flooding her email box, uh, I will say that I know of no person, no human being as nice as Ann Hillerman is. She is. She, she is the nicest person. She, the, the, she absolutely the most is. Person I know. She's, she's uh, absolutely so, and, and so please don't, don't everybody write to Ann Hillerman, but uh, read all of her books first and tell oh, her if yeah. you like read them. Yeah. She's a wonderful author. She, she and really she's is. been on and she's been on our show. And she, I mean, she's an amazing author. And and I was a fan of her dad's from his first book since 1970, and was very distressed when he passed away. We used to search the library. We to used to <laughs> find his latest book. I know. Back in the day. Back in the day when we, I couldn't afford to buy books. Right. Right. And um, and then. When Anne decided to uh, to pick up where he had left off, I've read other authors that's happened to, and I won't I won't name them, and it's been disappointing. Okay, Anne did not disappoint. Her her books are wonderful. She her uh, her voice is different. Her uh, POV is from Bernadette Manu Manuelito from a woman's point of view, and it. However, she Absolutely. doesn't. She doesn't um, take away from right. Jim Chi or Joe Lee Porn at all. And um, I just, I, it's amazing. It, you know, she preserved her father's she voice did. legacy. She yeah. did. And he's he's there, mm -hmm. and his storytelling is there. Um, but she brought something more to it. And frankly, oh, she did. if and Tony yeah. lived and were if he were still writing, I would hope that he would evolve over that period of time and maybe oh, I think he'd he be bringing to... those things. So yes. I don't think in her case, I think it's one of the times when it has really worked well. Oh, and so well. Uh, she's improved his series, the franchise, mm -hmm. uh, and she's made it her own. She's, yes, she's not somebody trying to mimic Tony Hillerman. No, right, right. but but she did 
all of the readers a huge favor by allowing us to continue to read and see where these characters I mean, I am so appreciative <laughs> because I've loved every single one of those characters in, um, you know, to watch them continue to grow and to continue their journey. We get to see their Excellent. journey and it's, it's, it's been a wonderful thing. But Think about what you just said in light of what we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. that, that, care that you have for a character or characters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how it propels you through the story to the end. Yep. In, in this particular case, we're talking about multiple books. Yes. But will you still care about Jim Chi and Joe Lee Porn and, and now um, uh, that's the goal. The goal mm -hmm. is to create real characters that people can care about because they mm -hmm. will carry everybody through the book. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be emotionally involved with like, them. Whether it's Woodrow Bell or mm -hmm. Father Clancy or mm -hmm. or the guys of Death Row, I hope it's mm -hmm. there. I hope it's mm -hmm. in that book too. Yeah. Well, they that character was very real in yeah. everything he's what you read was right. so authentic, as I said. Yeah. It was you were really, there, you know those people. <laughs> really kicked I, it off. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. We live in that community. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> I Nobody. think we all do. I think we all do. We can all look around and see those guys in the diner. And if if no, if I mean they live them, on our street. It, we it, live in a retirement community. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> I think if death row home. works, if the book <laughs> works then people will look around in the diner and they'll see people and mm -hmm. and they'll think about death row and they'll think about that that uh, that inner life that's going on over there in the corner and i i just think that's the purpose of literature to to give us a different perspective when we're done we see things differently yeah. and also you know what it will really help younger people to who read it to understand and to be em more em have Empathetic. more em yeah. empathy for people who are senior Absolutely. citizens. And yes. because it is true, I can tell you that when, you know, I was a 30 year old redhead, I got a lot more attention when I walked into a store <laughs> than I do now. And yeah. that's, that is no joke. That's, that's the truth. Yeah. It's just a reality, a fact. It is of a life. reality. You you touch upon it, and maybe some people need to be more have more empathy for for that. Yeah. Or just see things differently. Just just be open to the idea that there's a different life out there. There's a different <laughs> way of life. There's a different um, way of thinking. Mm -hmm. we, we've talked about that ourselves, and, mm -hmm. and I think it's part of breaking down walls. It's just. Yeah understanding and that's the danger is when a book like death row is a mystery people want a, f a kind of brain candy they they want to they want bing 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 they want it to follow the the kind of normal rhythms of a mystery um then along comes this guy and says well yeah i'm gonna do that but i'm also going to write about <laughs> men growing old yeah. Yeah. i'm in the sequel um, uh, one of them dies. And, oh. uh, so I find myself exploring how older men grieve and especially how older men grieve among other older men hmm. and yes. trying to capture that because I know it's different. And I, it, what does that have to do with a mystery? I, I, I not much, but it is a it's a subplot that I think is worth exploring. <laughs> right, right. That's good. Okay, well. Well, this has been great. Thank Once you for having me tonight. I really, really had a great time. So did we. So thank did you we? for being on the show. We appreciate it so much. Hold on to your chair. I'm going to move you over to the side <laughs> here. There we go. And, oh, we'll see. Okay, where were we? Oh, I yeah. don't know. <laughs> Next week, Robin Madrich.
romance author and slant, Joe Allen Ash, young adult uh, author as well, will be here next Wednesday live. And Who Saturday, feels comfortable having two brands. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday episode rewind is Doug Cooper, 5.30 p.m. Eastern time right here where you're watching the show right now. Yeah. And stay tuned uh, for the information about Voice of Indy uh, at the end broadcast, of the broadcast, which has already started, I believe. Yeah, they have. They have already started. But hop on over there and say hi. Yes. Live every Wednesday, your Voice of Indie hosts, Beam Weeks and Stephen G's, welcome authors, musicians, publishing industry pros, artists, and assorted creative guests for an exciting interactive hour. Call in during the show or post questions and comments on Twitter for responses in real time. Meet your favorite indie creators, learn inside tips, network, and promote your work. The link for each week's show is pinned on Twitter atop at Voice of Indie. And you can receive the link every Wednesday morning in your inbox by subscribing to our newsletter at freshinkgroup.com. Check out Voice of Indie every Wednesday on Blog Talk Radio and catch hundreds of episodes archived everywhere from our websites to our YouTube channel and Spotify. Thank you for joining us here on Meet the Author. Make sure you stay up to date with our show by clicking like, follow, and share. And you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and more. See you next time on WLFE-FM.